All right, um, let's go ahead and get started. Hello, I'm Graham Melstrand. I'm the Executive Vice President of Community Health and Wellness for the American Council on Exercise and the President of the Board of Directors for the Physical Activity Alliance. The Physical Activity Alliance wants to welcome all of you to today's briefing and to say thank you to the members of Congress, their staff, and our esteemed speakers for taking time out of their busy schedules for this briefing on physical activity and national security. Before I introduce our speakers, I wanna share just a little bit about the Alliance. Um, next slide, please. The Alliance's mission is to lead efforts to create, support, and advocate policy and system change that enable all Americans to, do, to enjoy physically active lives. Next slide. Maritari, are you able to, to advance the slides? I'm sorry, for some reason, the PowerPoint froze. Give me just one second. Okay. I can continue without our slides. So our our vision is for an active and healthy nation where the opportunity for physical activity is easily available in daily lives of all Americans. Our membership is composed of health advocacy organizations, academia, professional societies, trade organizations, and industry that have physical activity as a critical part of their advocacy portfolio. The Alliance combines deep expertise in policy advocacy, strategic planning, and workforce development in physical activity. We connect the strategic national physical activity plan to policy and advocacy and the professionals promoting physical public health approaches to physical activity. We engage leading researchers and public health professionals for meaningful policy system change with a focus on the policies and systems that help make the most significant health impact. We provide education for professionals in public health, education and beyond. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers, Dr. Ruth Peterson, Dr. Peterson serves as the director of the CDC's Division of Nutrition, Physical Activity and Obesity. The division provides national leadership on nutrition, physical activity and obesity prevention through policy and guideline development, surveillance, research, technical assistance to communities and states. Brigadier General John Klein is the commanding general for the US Army Center for Initial Military Training and responsible for annually transforming 130,000 plus civilian volunteers and to soldiers of character who are committed to our Army values, competent in their warrior tasks, physically fit and disciplined. He's also responsible for providing direct oversight of the Army's Holistic Health and Fitness Program, H2F. Major General John Andoni is the Deputy Director of the Army National Guard. He guides the formulation, development, and implementation of all programs and policies affecting soldiers of the Army National Guard, 50 states, three territories, and the District of Columbia. He served as the deputy director since January, 2021. Lieutenant Colonel Kelly Howard serves in the US Army Reserves and is the vice president for the University of Health and Performance in Bentonville, Arkansas. She previously developed the whole health education program for the Department of Veterans Affairs and is a board certified health coach and yoga instructor. Dr. Daniel Bornstein, he's the chair of the military setting sector of the US National Physical Activity Plan and is the founding director of D. Bornstein Solutions, LLC, a consulting company operating at the intersection of fitness, health, and national security. And now our first speaker, Dr. Peterson. Thank you, Graham, and welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to be here this morning and afternoon, depending on your time zone, to talk about physical activity and national security in the United States. Next slide, please. Today, I want to emphasize that physical inactivity and poor nutrition are threats to our national security. As you can see on the slide, people are not getting enough physical activity. They're not eating enough healthy foods, and our obesity rate continue to climb among adults and children. Next slide. Now I want to focus on the challenges we see regarding obesity and physical inactivity and their impact on both military eligibility and military readiness. Recent data from the CDC shows that most young adults 
in the United States are ineligible for military service, with only two in five young adults being both weight eligible and adequately active. This adds to the military's struggle to recruit. Beyond recruitment, obesity and physical inactivity are threats to military readiness and national security in the United States. Each year, the Department of Defense, our nation's largest employer, spends $1.5 billion in obesity-related health care costs for service members and their families. Physical inactivity is also associated with costly basic training discharge across the services. In addition, service members with obesity may be more likely to sustain musculoskeletal injuries than service members with a healthy weight. And this is very concerning because 19% of active duty service members had obesity in 2020, which was up 16% from 16% in 2015. Next slide. The good news is that we know how to overcome these threats. The key lies in creating healthy communities where everyone has the chance to live a healthy life that includes physical activity and healthy foods. This would include where active duty service members, reservists, and potential military recruits and their families live. Here are four ways CDC drives action to increase physical activity in communities. First, CDC provides the data to identify geographical areas where disease burden and risk factors are the highest in the country. This allows CDC and partners to use this information to drive action in the next three areas that you see on this slide. Let me give you now examples of how CDC provides funding and technical assistance to states, builds partnerships, including a strong one with Department of Defense, and creates safe places for physical activity. Next slide. CDC is supporting military members and their families with our state-based programs to create healthy communities where everyone has the chance to live an active life. CDC's State Physical Activity and Nutrition Program, or SPAN, as we called it, as we call it, funds 16 states, as you see here in the teal colored across the country, to support access to healthy nutrition and physical activity. Through SPAN, CDC provides funding and technical assistance to states, most commonly through state health departments who partner with sectors like transportation to implement evidence-based interventions, like the creation and planning for bikeways, crosswalks, and complete street design. Next slide. CDC has an established relationship with DOD to support their total force fitness framework through the Building Healthy Military Communities pilot. This pilot is driving action so military personnel, both active and reserved, and their families have a chance to live a healthy life that includes physical activity and healthy foods. Since 2018, CDC collaborated with Department of Defense and provides funding to help ensure physical activity strategies are built into those nine pilot state action plans, similar to our Fan model, the Building Healthy Military Communities focuses on making communities healthier, here with the extra focus on communities with high military population. Next slide. In addition to funding state and local recipients across the country, CDC also leads Active People Healthy Nation, a national initiative that aims to help 27 million more Americans become more physically active by 2027, utilizing the seven evidence-based strategies that you see on the signpost on this slide. The work we fund through SPAN and Building Healthy Military Communities focuses on the top signpost, which helps improve neighborhoods, communities, and cities, so there are more places for physical activity. We know that Active People Healthy Nation is one part of the key in creating healthy communities where everyone, including active duty service members, reservists, and potential military recruits, has the chance to live a healthy life and therefore increase our national security. Next slide. In my very brief time with you, I've shared a few snapshots of our work. I'm happy to answer any questions in our follow-up or follow-up with anyone that would like additional information on any of our programs. 
Thank you. Over to the next speaker now. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. Um, General Klein, you're next, please. Okay, great. Um, and first, let me just start by thanking Dan Bornstein and everybody on the Physical Activity Alliance for your leadership on this topic and for the invitation to participate today. For all of you, if you are not familiar with Lieutenant General Mark Hurtling, I highly recommend that you, after this presentation, uh, you Google him. Again, that's uh, Mark Hurtling. And I think what you'll find is a compelling TED Talk where he predicts in 20 to 30 years, obesity and declining physical fitness will have a significant impact on our youth, our country financially, and our national security. He describes the impact of low physical activity on bone density. Specifically, young soldiers fracturing the femoral neck along the hip, uh, and it's caused by uh, them exercising here in basic training, and it's also uh, due to their sedentary lifestyles, um, especially when you put a load on them, a rucksack or, or the like, and so they're experiencing fractures along the hip there. He also goes on to describe the financial costs that are associated with that, and he, sh he shares a, a number that's between $100,000 and $300,000 to repair the damage for each one of these fractures. He also describes poor nutrition and the choices that we make in terms of increased sugar consumption, supersized fast food menu options, and he introduces the, uh, the audience to the humorous O food group, Doritos, tacos, nachos, Oreos, and he makes the claim that nothing ever good came out of anything that ended in the letter O. If you haven't seen it, look it up. It's a fantastic presentation, and if anything, it's probably going to make you a little bit nervous about America's future. I know for me personally, uh, it led to a, a run and then a couple salads uh, following that presentation. What's concerning is that Lieutenant General Mark Hurtling preceded me as the commanding general for CIMT 13 years ago. And the TED talk that I'm talking about, well, he gave that presentation 10 years ago in 2012. And his prediction of 20 to 30 years until national security was threatened was a little bit off. It's only been 10 years and we are starting to feel the impacts right now on recruiting. You might be aware that the Army was struggling over the last few years to achieve our mission. And this year's projections indicate we might fall short. In 2012, General Hurtling described how the eligible population to serve in the Army was only 25%. And you just heard a, a quote, two out of five is eligible in terms of uh, their physical capability. But when you compound that with academic requirement, medical requirements, moral requirements, uh, that's where you get the 25% that he claimed 10 years ago. Today, that percentage of eligible population is 23%. And the future gets worse given the current trajectory. The largest disqualifier being obesity. We understand it that the ages between 17 and 24 of the eligible population are categorized as obese. And it's brought on by a combination of poor nutrition, it's reduced physical education in our schools, it's parent modeling uh, that is similar in the sedentary behavior that the kids are exercising. And to a certain extent, technology gets blamed uh, based on screen time. In comparing the statistics Lieutenant General Hurtling shared 10 years ago, some of the data suggests we consume slightly less sugar and more schools are making an attempt to promote physical fitness, but it's marginal and frankly, it's not enough. Obesity continues to rise and physical activity continues to decline or flatline in some cases. The average screen time that's gaming, that's web surfing, that's uh, on your phone is now eight hours and 39 minutes a day. Uh, that's up two hours from what General Hurtling briefed back in 2012, six hours and 40 minutes back then. So unless you're, you're looking at your screen uh, on the exercise bike or the treadmill, it's likely sedentary time and it's not beneficial for any of us, much less future soldiers. Now, personally, I, I don't think this is a problem our government or our army can solve on its own, but it's something that all of us can certainly influence. And it's uh, opportunities like this one that are so, so important for us in terms of changing the trajectory that we are currently headed. Within the Army, there's a lot we can do once these volunteers arrive at our any one of our Army training centers, and we have four of them. And eventually, when they get into the operational force, the challenge is finding individuals that are propensed to serve, and right now that's only 9%, and can also meet our entrance standards. As the Chief of Staff of the Army has recently said, as of recent as yesterday, I read an article this morning that we're in a warp on talent, and Everybody wants the same population. 
it's all services and it's it's American business. It's everybody because of the caliber uh, that we're all after. And those of us in uniform are not immune to obesity either. Yes, we have standards that we must maintain, but the trajectory we are on also shows an average rise over time in our BMI. So to help change this trajectory and promote health across the Army, we've invested quite a bit in programs like holistic health and fitness, uh, better known as H2F for those of us in the Army. And it follows a model that's very similar to what our professional and collegiate teams follow. It's fairly a new initiative that shows tremendous promise. Currently involves resourcing active duty brigades with teams of health specialists to educate, care for, and monitor soldier health across five domains of health. Physical, mental, nutritional, spiritual, and sleep. And these H2F teams come in three different varieties, depending on the unit that they're going to, to support. I'll just give you an example of our ro most robust uh, team model. So if you're going to one of our brigade combat teams, manned at about 4,000 individuals, the H2F team that will be embedded into that brigade under the watchful eye of that brigade commander is about 37 people strong. It comes with a director, an occupational therapist, physical therapists, athletic trainers, strength and conditioning coaches, cognitive performance specialists, and registered dietitians. Much like our collegiate and professional sports do, we surround our soldiers like athletes and we provide this expertise to try to change the trajectory in their health. Currently, we have 28 brigades that are fielded right now. The plan is to field 110 brigades by 2030. And yes, this comes at an expense, somewhere around $1 billion. We've also updated the Army's doctrine, FM 7-22, which is holistic health and fitness. So that's our baseline in which we educate everybody. And we are educating the Army at all levels throughout professional military education. We start this education at basic training and we address it at all levels up to general officer. Additionally, you may have heard we've introduced a new Army combat fitness test. That's not hard to find if you look anywhere on social media. Uh, but I, what I've observed is a changing of culture within the last three to four years while we were uh, piloting this particular test. You would watch gymnasiums over a period of months gut some of the old equipment that was in there and instead put in it bullet bars, squat racks, all those things that are required to get after all 10 components of physical fitness. Our previous tests for 40 years exercised primarily muscular endurance. The current test, it encourages, it forces, um, it inspires soldiers to get after all 10 components. So we're talking things like balance, muscular strength, power, agility, flexibility, things like that. The National Physical Activity Plan, or this strategy, I should say, that, that Dan and the team have laid out, we think it's good. And as DOD leads us through their strategy for improving health, the Army is not waiting. We're moving out in parallel with initiatives like H2F, which include a few of the objectives laid out in the NPAP. Specifically, strategy two, education, employment of qualified personnel on H2F performance teams. I just relayed some of that with you all and there's more going in the space. I also own the master fitness training course, and we do a lot of educating there to make sure operational forces have the capability within our units. And on strategy four, which is physical activity and physical training programs, uh, a lot of, we've done a lot in that particular strategy as well, but we also acknowledge that we can't fix the, the last 18 years of a, of a youth's life. And once they're in the army though, we can, we can take a proven approach looking at the soldier's health and fitness holistically. I'll wrap up my remarks by sharing that I think we all recognize that changing the future can take a generation, if not longer. But given the current trajectory, we can't wait that long. This topic is one that we collectively must continue to shine a very bright light on. It's one that I don't think the government or the Army can necessarily solve on its own, given the fact that we represent a fraction of 1% of America's population, although we can certainly continue to set a positive example in hopes that others will follow. General Hartling was right 10 years ago when he shared that we need to be fearless with our efforts to improve nutrition at home and in our restaurants. We need to be fearless with balancing our lives and promoting physical activity and fearless in modeling behavior for our youth. I can only hope that my replacement, seven commanders from now, because that's how far General Hartling was in front of me in this command, I can only hope seven commanders right from now, they're telling a different story, one of success across America. Thanks for your time. Thank you, General Klein. Um, 
General Andoni um, is our next speaker. Good afternoon, everyone out there. And on behalf of the Director of the Army National Guard, Lieutenant General Jensen, thanks for having me on today. And it's a privilege to be able to sit here and talk with you today about uh, the National Physical Health Activity Plan and the Army's Holistic Health and Fitness Program and how they relate to the reserve component. So you'll find a lot of things I'm gonna to say to you are in line with what General Klein just talked about. I'm gonna talk more about how we're executing that within um, the Army National Guard and also the reserve component um, and, and to give you an idea of some of the challenges we're facing. But before I continue, I'll give you an example of my own story, which I kind of think highlights the challenges of the reserve component. Uh, when I learned about the new combat uh, fitness test that uh, General Klein alluded to, um, I was 51 years old. And I'll be honest, I was a little uh, afraid of the test because at 51 years old, I'm changing my paradigm. I'm changing how I train for it. Uh, so I needed help with that, and, and because I'm not on an active duty base as a guardsman, I had to find my own way to get after it. So I hired a personal trainer, I'm not advocating that, that, that all guardsmen do that, but I had to do that personally in order to be able to prepare for the test. What I tell everyone is that the preparation for the ACFT taught me a lot about myself, and it taught me a lot about how to optimize my own performance. And I think ultimately that's what we want our reservists and our guardsmen to do. We want them to maximize their performance physically, mentally, and spiritually. But that being said, we have some significant challenges uh, in the reserve component. The biggest challenge is time. We only have one week in a month and two weeks a year to connect with our soldiers. Maybe a little more, but generally it's, it's only a portion of the year. This limits our ability to connect with each soldier and assist them in coaching and mentoring. And it places a big responsibility on the individual to take care of themselves when they're not at drill and they're not at annual training. The second significant challenge is geographic dispersion. The Army National Guard exists in over 2,400 communities across the US. And I know the Army Reserve has a similar challenge with dispersion. This makes it an imperative for us to partner up with local communities, academia, and industry in order to find solutions for our Guard H2F programs um, and the Reserve as well. To address these challenges in the Army National Guard, we've created these regional resource networks. And these networks are, are staffed with full-time personnel using the, the resources that we have. And, and what we do is we leverage best practices uh, within each region to include our civilian acquired skills, because uh, as, you're, uh, as some of you are aware, in the Guard and Reserves, we have uh, members of the Guard and Reserve who have civilian skill sets. Uh, they're physical therapists, they're dietitians, they're uh, exercise consultants. They're folks that have skills that are of value to us and can be used and leveraged to improve our, our overall fitness programs. We've also leveraged partnerships. Uh, I'm only, there's many of them, but I'm only gonna give you one and that's the Wisconsin National Guard. They developed a comprehensive health and wellness course that we're actually leveraging nationwide. And this is in partnership with the University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point. It's basically a two-week course that trains our guardsmen on how to improve their fitness, and it's coupled with a virtual health clinic that's sponsored by the university. So this is an example of a very strong partnership uh, that we're leveraging to get after uh, better fitness. One thing is certain, and, and General Klein referred to it earlier, we cannot settle for the status quo. We have to start working now, leveraging the existing resources we have and maximizing our supports to the states. Uh, but we need the partnerships with our communities, with academia, with industry to expand and sustain these H2F programs. I'll leave you all with one quote and it's from the director of the Army National Guard, Lieutenant General Jensen. And he said this uh, recently, as citizen soldiers, our members make up the greater communities in which we live and work. As leaders in our communities, we must possess the knowledge and resources to facilitate personal health readiness and create environments where the healthy choice is the easy choice. I think Lieutenant General Jensen summed it up perfectly. At the end of the day, we're trying to change the culture of our force so that soldiers make the healthy choice the easy choice. Thanks for your time and attention this afternoon. And I'll be standing by for questions. Thank you, General. Um, Colonel Howard, our next speaker, please. 
All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lieutenant Colonel Kelly Howard, and I'm here to speak about what physical activity has meant for me as an active duty service member, a reservist, and a veteran. Going to share my slides here. All right, so back in 1995, I was the youngest finisher of the Richmond Marathon. My athleticism helped me earn a spot at the US military. Academic athletics leadership in equal measure. Here is part of the training to be leaders in the Army. We all became master fitness trainers, and our GPA included our PTS scores. At West Point, I competed on the Maryland Me to avoid having to practice drone ceremony. But being so physically fit also had the added benefit of credibility in a male dominated culture. Both in, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> both in school and with the soldiers that I would serve with later in Iraq. Running through the desert landscape of Iraq and then teaching yoga in Baghdad during my second tour gave me and my fellow service members a way to cope with the stresses that surrounded us. There was not a whole lot that we could control during this time, but working out on a regular basis was the main way that we got through these deployments. After 10 years on active duty, I became a board certified health and wellness coach through Duke Integrative Medicine, and I transitioned to develop the VA's whole health education program. Here I learned about the issues of chronic physical and mental illness that so many of my fellow veterans faced. I saw how when daily PT goes away, the downward spiral often begins. The VA represents the interconnectedness of health with what we call the circle of health, which illustrates how every area on the circle, including physical activity, which is moving the body circled here in orange, impacts the others. So for example, if physical activity declines, there may also be declines in personal relationship, sleep, nutrition, et cetera. The good news though is when one area of the circle improves, others improve as well. So they help other areas of their health also improve. In VA, what we've seen when veterans engage in whole health is reduced reliance on opioids, increased satisfaction with their health care, and reduced pain, just to name a few. And now holistic activities like yoga and tai chi are required to be offered at every VA facility. In March of this year, we held the first ever VA Whole Health DOD Total Force Fitness Summit, where VA shared learnings from the past 10 years to help further integrate holistic health into DOD in an effort to move more upstream from treatment to prevention. Partnerships like this help outcomes improve and costs reduce. In my position as an Army Reservist, my focus for the past couple years as part of the Army's H2F Directorate that you heard from General Klein has been spreading yoga enterprise wide. In a large pilot completed last year, we found that new recruits who experienced yoga and mindfulness were significantly less likely to be injured, had reduced depression and anxiety, improved unit cohesion and discipline, enhanced mental resilience, fewer sick hall visits, and less pain and fatigue. How amazing what changes in physical activity can make, which, oh, by the way, also resulted in significant man hour and financial savings for the Army. It would be really impactful for best practices like this to spread to the other services as well via enhanced support to Total Force Fitness. Another solution that I see is to support organizations like the University of Health and Performance, where I currently serve which helps veterans and transitioning service members become a coach in a health or fitness related field. Our graduates go on to use their expertise in physical activity to help not only their fellow veterans, but the population at large. They are a catalyst to help the upward spiral. By improving fitness, lives also improve. This is just one example of how the private sector can be a solutions provider. One of the most heartbreaking about some of this earlier, I might be in a better place that I am now. I think if we as a country can make this a priority, we'd be able to see a lot of the problems that we see every day. We'd be able to solve a lot of the problems that we see every day, most, um, both in the military and beyond. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Colonel Howard. And 
Our final speaker before we open it up to questions is um, Dr. Bornstein, please. Thank you very much, Graham. Thanks especially to members of Congress and their representatives who are here today. Thanks to all of you from around the country and perhaps around the globe who are joining us. Thanks to my esteemed panel of co-presenters and a special thanks to the team at the Physical Activity Alliance without whom this briefing would not be possible. My name is Dan Bornstein and I'm here for three reasons today. First, to launch formally and publicly release the new military setting sector of the National Physical Activity Plan. Second, to provide some initial insight into the who, what, how, and why behind that military sector. And third, to challenge our elected and appointed leaders to do more, to increase physical activity across our population in order to increase the safety and security of our nation. Next slide, please. For those who may not be familiar with the national plan, until today, it's been organized around nine different societal sectors, all of which aim to increase opportunities for physical activity where all Americans live and work, play and pray, commute and learn. However, given the disturbing trends in recruiting, retention, readiness and lethality of our service members, as well as the disproportionately higher rates of physical and mental health disorders among our veterans. The National Plan and the Physical Activity Alliance recognize the need for adding this new military sector in an effort to limit the domino effect that physical inactivity is having on our national security. You heard some recruiting statistics a bit earlier, and I'd like to add one more. A recent report from the Pentagon shows that among all age eligible Americans, those who meet the minimum requirements for service and also have the propensity to serve rests at a mere 2%. Clearly, it's time for some change. Next slide, please. In an effort to help the DOD and VA lead the nation in creating this culture change, the military sector is organized around four specific subpopulations, service members across all branches and components, the families of those service members, veterans, and civilians working for the DOD and the VA. Next slide, please. In developing the new military sector, we wanted to ensure that we were in line with our national security strategy and national defense strategy. We also wanted to ensure direct support for and connections among numerous existing initiatives across federal government, all of which have include or include physical activity as a cornerstone, and not all of which you see represented here, but many you do. Next slide, please. The military sector is organized around six different strategies. As a registrant for today's briefing, you should have received a PDF which provides much greater detail into each of these strategies with their respective tactics and objectives. And if you review that document, you'll see that we provide a comprehensive, a comprehensive set of upstream, midstream, and downstream solutions for some of the critical challenges facing the DOD and the VA. As you heard from General Klein and General Andoni, as the Army has worked to roll out H2F, there is some progress that is being made. And as you just heard from Lieutenant Colonel Howard, the VA is making some great progress with the whole health initiative. However, there is a tremendous amount of work yet to be done. Next slide, please. The process to develop the military sector took just over a year and included a large group of subject matter experts individuals who swim in these waters of physical activity and national security on a daily basis. We started with our expert panel of 16 individuals. We then divided that panel into four subcommittees for each of the subpopulations that I previously identified. And in many instances, we added additional subject matter experts to each of those subcommittees. Finally, we engaged an independent group of additional subject matter experts 
to provide what the military folks would call a quote unquote sanity check on the content of the military sector to ensure that it was on target. Next slide, please. Here you see the membership of the military sector's expert panel, the individuals who were brought forth to oversee the entire development of the military sector. And today I just wanna take a brief opportunity to thank them for their service, not only to this effort, but to this country. Thank you very, very much. Next slide. Across all those different groups that I just mentioned, the expert panel, the subcommittees, and the independent review process, you'll see that we had a diverse group of organizations represented from across the government, academia, as well as industry and nonprofits. Next slide, please. You have heard some of the reasons why we need a military sector. And I'm gonna go one step further today in putting that in the context of perhaps our greatest near peer threat, China. 30 plus years ago, we dominated China on the playing field. But as you can see, where we once dominated, we no longer do. While this may not seem terribly troubling, it may be an indicator of something that is. Next slide, please. While we have been fortunate to not yet have to face China on the battlefield, preliminary evidence suggests that we may be losing ground there as well. U.S. Army soldiers, male and female, get injured at a substantially higher rate than their Chinese counterparts. These musculoskeletal injuries that you heard General Klein talking about and Dr. Peterson talking about remain and have been called the single greatest medical impediment to our military readiness. MSKIs, as they're abbreviated, cost the DOD $3.7 billion annually to treat, and they account for 25 million limited duty days across the military each year. Next slide, please. The bottom line up front is that the challenges we face with our current, future, and former service members are a direct reflection of the physical activity levels across our population. In 2019, 67% of American high schoolers failed to meet the federal physical activity guidelines on a daily basis. And as Dr. Peterson mentioned, in 2020, 75% of American adults also failed to meet the federal physical activity guidelines. The reality is that we are providing the DOD with a bunch of lemons and asking them to make lemonade from them. That ask is both unfair and unsustainable if we hope to maintain the viability of our all volunteer force and the health and vitality of our veterans. Next slide, please. There are two ways ahead. The first, inaction. Inaction will result in further decreased readiness and lethality of our warfighters. Continued declines in the quality and quantity of life among our service members, their families, our veterans, and civilians working for the DOD and VA. And inaction will lead to persistence of the unsustainable costs for treating the physical and mental health conditions that could otherwise be prevented. However, there's another way forward, action. Action in the form of using the military sector and the rest of the NPAP as a roadmap for cultivating a whole of government approach that breaks down silos and builds bridges within and across federal agencies while providing collaborative opportunities with other key stakeholders to address this critical national security issue. Our sincerest hope is that we use today as a launch pad for action. In the coming weeks and months, we look forward to working with you, our elected and appointed leaders, to identify the leadership role you can play in improving the physical activity, fitness, and security of our nation. Thank you very much. We'll now open it up to questions.
So I do see a question here uh, for the two generals, General Klein and or General Andoni. How is H2F helping soldiers who may be overweight or injured? How does H2F help soldiers who may be struggling physically to recover from injuries and mentally get back to the force? Hey, thanks, Dan. I'll, I'll jump on that one. Um, so I'll share that uh, uh, the Chief of Staff of the Army approved 16 measures of effectiveness in which we're going to monitor the progress of, uh, of H2F. Um, and the data admittedly is a little bit immature right now because uh, we've just started the, the program. Um, early indications are, are fairly positive, although I will share with the group that it's somewhat reactive um, for our physical therapists, athletic trainers, and the like. So what we're, what we're learning out there as we go and visit the units that have the capability, um, we're spending some time, you know, uh, treating uh, injuries or uh, ankle sprains and things of the nature because um, not everybody is uh, uh, going through like proper periodization when they're working out. You know, it could be a young soldier shows up and leadership says, hey, we're going to do the workout of the day, a CrossFit workout of the day. And so maybe they're not quite ready for that, um, but largely very positive. To, to, to answer the question on, on, on uh, you know, how they care for the individuals out there, there's been phenomenal um, best practices that we've seen out there. And, um, you know, for, for our members of the, the House or the Senate, I would encourage you to uh, visit any one of our active duty units that have the uh, H2F programs um, within their ranks, and, and uh, if you feel so inclined to work out with them, because what you'll what you'll see is they'll employ all five domains. You, you'll come in, you'll sign in. Um, I, I went to a unit here recently where I had my phone and I hit a QR code and I had to answer some questions. How did I sleep? Did I drink last night? Um, how am I feeling emotionally right now? Am I depressed? I mean, so you're looking at all, not just the physical component of this thing. And then um, I'll, we'll you'll line up with some strength and conditioning coaches and they'll warm you up and then you'll eventually break down into some uh, ability groups, if you will, to get after um, muscular strength and power. Uh, so you get a full full workout uh, and you'll likely close with uh, things that are you know similar to yoga and mindfulness. Um, you get a good stretch out and get a chance to kind of uh, decompress a little bit before you start your day. Um, and as I mentioned, given the experts that are on that team, you think about it, you know, occupational therapists, registered dietitians, you know, athletic trainers, it's, it is completely holistic. Uh, and one of the interesting findings that we're, we're seeing is that um, we're, these teams are also helping quite a bit in the, um, on the mental side of things. Uh, and to date, I can, I just recently briefed Army senior leaders on this, that uh, by my count, there were five lives that were saved. Uh, because soldiers um, uh, felt it was okay to, to, to talk to some of these individuals that, you know, that are wearing civilian clothes and many have goatees and, you know, they're coming right out of uh, the NCAA athletic programs. And, um, you know, so they share and build relationships and, uh, and these teams then come together to realize, hey, we got an individual that may be a little more depressed than we're comfortable with. And so we, we need to get the uh, cognitive performance specialist, or maybe we're going to bring in the chaplain um, to, uh, to do a little deeper dive on this individual um, so we can uh, change the trajectory that individual's on. Um, but I think this summer we'll do our first report to the chief staff of the army. Um, we'll see what the, what the army senior leaders are willing to share. But uh, I'm convinced that as we progress here in the months to come, that the data is going to be, uh, it, it, it should be very positive. Hopefully that answers the question. Thank you, General Klein, for uh, that response. General Andona, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, just a quick, uh, and just to add on to what General Klein was saying. Uh, so I, I think we're right, like right now, especially within the Guard, we have largely a reactive model. Uh, but we are trying to move more toward a preventive model uh, and we're trying to get after that uh, through like I, like I said every state has a different solution but some of the states have developed these programs where they bring in their soldiers in for a week or two and uh, they have a physical therapist who's on the Army National Guard uh, staff uh, within the state and they'll bring this individual in to train our soldiers how to prevent injury, how to how to uh, exercise and improve their muscular strength so they avoid injury. And I think that's a, a small step forward within our within our structure to try and get at a more preventive model rather than a reactive model. 
Uh, just some thoughts to follow on with what Joe Klein was talking about. Yeah, th thanks, thanks to you both for those responses. Uh, for those of you who are following the chat, I want to provide one comment on a comment that was provided uh, from Reagan Stigman. Uh, so Reagan has been involved in, in our process from the very beginning. And, and Reagan, I want to thank you publicly for the tremendous effort you've put forth and, and also point towards uh, the work that the American College of Lifestyle Medicine is doing in the physical activity arena and others. So if you get a chance to look at some of the links that Reagan has provided in the chat, please go ahead and do that. Um, I wanna address a question coming in from Janet Williams, and, and this has also been echoed by some other individuals. Uh, Janet, thank you for the question. The question is, what is the military doing about nutrition and availability of nutritious foods? Being physically active is just one piece of the solution. And uh, Janet, you're absolutely right, physical activity, is part of a comprehensive set of strategies that need to be deployed to improve the readiness, health, lethality, and so on of our service members and our veterans. And I'll admit that the, the military sector of the national plan is pretty squarely focused on physical activity uh, because we feel physical activity is underrepresented in, in a number of other national strategic level efforts. Um, with that also said, I will say that Building Healthy Military Communities, which is part of the DOD, uh, does look at nutrition as well as a number of other uh, 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 things, including physical activity. And there are other programs as well that do take this holistic look. And, and the Army's Holistic Health and Fitness and, and the DOD's Total Force Fitness also include nutrition as a key pillar in their efforts to improve the whole health. And the same is true with you know, the whole health program of the VA. So it's not that nutrition has been forgotten, it's that we felt it was important to highlight the importance of physical activity. So thank you for that question, very important. Let me scroll down and see if there are any others. Uh, um, so a question in from uh, Jamie Monroe. Jamie, thanks for tuning in. Uh, the question, if only 2% of the population is military eligible, what is the military sector's plan for physical activity to improve recruiting before candidates join? Uh, just a quick caveat, that 2% figure, which came out of the Pentagon, um, is a number that is not just those who are eligible, but, but, but those who are eligible and have the propensity to serve. Um, so I just want to be clear on that. And what is the military sector's role in uh, physical activity promotion to improve recruiting before candidates join? Great question. Um, one of the areas in which the military sector is trying to do that is with some programs looking at pre-accession fitness. So if you look at, I believe it's uh, strategy four, which is, uh, which is programs, uh, there, you will see that there's some effort there to try to impact uh, the, sort of the immediate upstream problem that to a general client seems to be inheriting from the rest of the population. But uh, another area in which the military sector is, is trying to improve efforts across the country is to actually work across the other sectors of the national plan to get into those communities, to impact our schools and communities and so on. So, so we've got robust youth sport programs, and I would point you uh, towards the national youth sport strategy, that we have robust physical activity and physical education programs in our schools. So the military sector We'll be working in collaboration. I mentioned, you know, uh, 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 breaking down silos and building bridges, and the military sector and the other sectors of the national plan are doing just that. Uh, we have to get out of our own silos and work together to find some of these solutions, and we're already in the process of doing that. So, um, so thanks for that question, Jamie. Um, let me see if there are some others here. Um, a question. Many are also leaving the military due to mental health. Is there a program to work on this area as well? And I think I'm going to defer to uh, General Klein and General Andoni since I don't actually represent the military, uh, but I'll allow them to uh, provide some comment here. Yeah, thanks, Dan. I'll start with that one. Um, Hopefully the camera here is on me. I don't know if you can see me or not. All it looks like I'm looking at the ceiling or something. You've, you've got, sir, you've got a very good looking ceiling. <laughs> I don't know what's up with that. This thing is, anyway, so just trust me. Uh, I'm looking at you all square in the face, but um, 
Uh, yeah, so the mental side is, uh, there's a, there's many things that we're doing on the mental side, um, and it's not all tied to H2F. I mean, we've got uh, significant initiatives that are going on throughout our Army, uh, Army-wide, uh, to get after uh, some of the challenges on the mental front. I will share with you, and I'm comfortable talking about those things that are going on within H2F. Um, uh, you know, specifically, I, I mentioned uh, the two domains that I put a lot of emphasis into, and that is specifically the mental domain and the spiritual domain. Um, and it's interesting to see that uh, a lot of the feedback that we're getting as we send our teams out to go look at uh, what our H2F teams are doing, um, we're getting a lot of responses that are related to the mental side of this. It's a reason why we're putting things like mindfulness within our program. There's a reason why our teams have, uh, um, you know, uh, cognitive performance specialists and, and chaplains um, uh, to help get after the, uh, the challenges associated with it. Um, and then at the larger scale uh, across the Army, um, there's, you know, we have a, a Army uh, resiliency directorate that's up in the, the Pentagon. Um, we have a master resiliency school that, uh, that is taught, uh, that's afforded to many of our NCOs. Um, so they can hone their skills and learn how to teach others on how to cope, how to deal with stress. Um, and there's many, many more initiatives that are out there. Uh, we recognize that uh, equally important to the physical side, uh, and sometimes I, I can make an argument even more so, that the, the mental component is um, one that we cannot be complacent on and have to drive hard to do better over. Yeah, thank you, General Klein. General Andoni, I wanted to see if you also wanted to add any response. In the Army's uh, resilience programs, we, we, we have uh, and we keep track of our master resilience trainers throughout the states and territories. And we really rely on our MRTs to conduct training uh, within their states to help our soldiers uh, you know, provide them with coping uh, uh, tactics and mechanisms to better improve their resiliency and their, and their mental fitness. Uh, we also expanded our behavioral health counselors throughout the 54 states and territories recently. We, we've grown that population to, uh, to address uh, mental health behaviors uh, as well. Um, I think a lot of this comes down to building cohesive teams like the Chief of Staff of the Army uh, constantly uh, emphasizes and, and it, in building these cohesive teams, you build these small networks, these small teams that are highly effective, cross talking with each other and helping each other to cope with problems and build resiliency. Uh, the last thing I'll add is we, we are starting uh, a program uh, called the Prevention Workforce. Uh, at the tune of 536 people that will be spread throughout the 54 states and territories to really get after uh, uh, eliminating the corrosives in our formations, things like sexual assault, sexual harassment, suicides. Uh, so we're hoping that through the prevention workforce uh, structure that we'll field over the next two years, we'll also be able to get after resiliency programs as well, because resiliency is also a, a way to get after some of these, uh, these uh, corrosive behaviors. Uh, so uh, I, I think we'll get some benefit out of that as well. Thank you, General Doni and General Klein for uh, those responses. We have had a number of questions come in and I, I think we have time for one more. So thanks to all of you who've, who've provided your questions. And as I said, hopefully today is the first of many conversations that lead to action. Uh, so a question that came in from Kim Ballard. Kim, thank you for your question. The question is, I heard about not having enough PA and PE time in schools, but I have not seen yet any strategies or objectives involving schools? Did I miss it? Or were schools left out for a reason to concentrate on public health? Um, and I, I will chime in here briefly, and then I'd also like to have Dr. Peterson chime in. Um, we actually do, in the military sector, talk about the importance of uh, DOD-connected students. So working in collaboration with DODEA and building healthy military communities, and also, there is an entire sector of the National Physical Activity Plan, the education sector, with a robust set of strategies, tactics, and objectives specifically aimed at this issue. But uh, Dr. Peterson, I'll also defer to you for your thoughts from the CDC's perspective. 
Thank you. And yes, there is an entire program on school health at CDC that I did not mention. And I'm glad Dan brought it up that it's part of the plan. It's very important. It's also important to look at early care and education centers because those habits for physical activity form very early. So a lot of the work that we do in our division is around looking at how to improve um, the quality um, system so that physical activity is part of early care and education. And this gets back to how you build communities where potential recruits live. So physical activity for some people, when you think about middle school, elementary school, and high school, maybe they weren't great experiences. So how do we make it fun where you live in your community so that biking and walking and moving and getting to the theater or getting to the grocery store involves health promoting behaviors? So that's really how we're working on redesigning communities. And that's what we're working on with building healthy military communities with DOD and the communities around those bases. So great question, and I just wanted to make sure people knew schools were, yes, very important. Over, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. We are at the conclusion of our time. I again want to thank all of you who have joined us today, and in particular, members of Congress and their representatives. We will be reaching out for further engagement to improve physical activity and national security across the country. Thanks to you all. Be well.